and, and thank you Deepika for thank you Ashish thank you Deepika for for inviting me to give this talk I'm I'm very happy to to be able to you gave me a good excuse to get up early in the morning so that was nice okay and uh, so so with that like uh, what I will do is uh, as uh, as Professor Gurk said, like I came to Purdue back in 2004, and uh, so around 18 years ago, and uh, that time I had a clean slate of tip, and I had to start my research, so I decided to start in, in solar, and I will take you through a journey, a little bit of uh, my first few early years, why solar, I kept asking myself, why not something else, because uh, that time solar was alien to me like i really had no experience with solar research and yet i picked it up so i will just take you through a couple of early slides why solar and then then i will make a transition to you know after i decided solar then i realized that it is not an easy game okay there are a lot of challenges so you, i spent the next few years learning about the challenges and then i will just give you some of my some of my flavor of my some of the research actually with that like uh, so why solar energy like you know because uh, and uh, so what happened was in early days when i came to purdue like you know i i beginning to look at for example if you look at the human population over the centuries like you know what you find is that the human race uh, give me a second so what you're going to find is that the human race population was more or less you know dwindling along like you know is was going along and uh, somewhere like you know the human race lived for a long time like you know all renewable resources and somewhere along uh, 1700 or so like you know the human population began to begin to really take off okay and so the issue was like uh, why did it suddenly begin to take off and 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 it's no no secret to us this was all because of the rise of coal okay and, and the discovery of the steam engine because uh, what happened was that the Suddenly, so people did not have to rely on oak trees, okay, or or the twigs to as a source of energy. So, biomass was the primary source of energy for, has been for most of the human existence till the, till the coal was uh, started being used, and suddenly people could fill the buckets and buckets with large quantities of energy, and then the steam engines came along. And and so Sunny Cardinal trying to explain the steam engine, he came up with the laws of thermodynamics, and suddenly there was an extra ex explosion of the human race, which uh, has been unparalleled as well. So the fossils have been a friend of human race. I think uh, the fact that I can give this seminar is itself a tribute to the fossil energy. And uh, so they have been friends, but, uh, and they have been here. But the question is like, uh, like it, it is leading to two things actually, our primary responsible for it. First is that fossils cannot last forever, right? Because the rate at which we consume energy far exceeds the, the rate at which it is being formed. So sooner or later, it's going to happen. And, and sooner or later, I mean, in the in the context of the human civilization. So, so in the year 3000, as we move to the right, okay, and keep going thousand years from now, we need to think what the human race would be living actually. And uh, so the question is, how long this fossil will last besides the environmental pollution, which I would not be touching. So it became very clear to me at that point in time, Eventually, at some point in time, human race must must transit from from the fossils to the renewable source of energy. And uh, whether it is in 2100 or 2200 or 23, whatever it is, but it has to happen because humans will be here for 3,000 years from now, actually. So, so having said that, so what can what could that energy source be, right? And and of course, for a sustainable world, that energy, I I realized that. Uh, it has to be a solar energy. And so once we realize that it has to be solar energy, then, uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so it has to be solar energy. So once we realize that, like, uh, so it has to be a solar economy period. And, uh, and why solar? Okay, the, the reason being solar is because the fraction of the solar incident irradiance which Earth uses, okay, is, is, is very small. So for example, like, uh, in, like, uh, it is 3.8 million exajoules a year of solar energy, which is falling on the planet Earth. And we use only roughly 530 exajoules. So it's a pretty small fraction. So it is the most abundant energy source that at almost every place on the Earth, almost not every place, but almost all the place gets the solar energy year round. So, so it's uh, if we learn how to use it in everything in our daily life, then I realized that, okay, all right. So that's what is can be a more meaningful research and uh, and if it did do use solar energy then 
you can almost do everything even and I'm a chemical engineer as Ashish told you and so we can make all the chemicals okay we can heat everything we can produce the electricity we can have mobilities and of course the food which comes from the solar energy the solar energy can meet almost every need which we have as a human race which fossils meet uh, and therefore certainly solar is is a very attractive option okay so if that is the case then um, then why is solar use not that prevalent even though it has been rising lately for the last five years or or rather 10 years but back in 2004 2005 it was like, why is the solar use not prevalent? So I spent like two, three years just thinking about that. And uh, so I will just share with you some of the challenges which I understood at that. And I still continue to take it in that context. Okay. And so the first thing I, I realized was that the solar energy is quite dilute as against the fossils, which are quite dense. And what do I mean by that? And, and what I mean by that is if you look at, like when I go and fill my, my car with petrol, what I, and I can fill something like 10 gallons of petrol, like, you know, in a, in a, in a minute, okay? And that's like 20 megawatts of power supply. So, so the rate at which I'm filling in my car, as you can see, is, is quite high actually, right? So 20 megawatts is, 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 a, is, is quite, quite a, it's like 20,000 homes could be powered for during that period. Okay, so, so the question is, if I needed the same amount of power from, from sun, what will it take? And, uh, and of course, solar incidence is roughly a kilowatt per meter square. So, so if you use that, then what it would mean is that if you wanted 20 megawatts of supply, I would need four soccer fields, so roughly four soccer fields, to, which is the area of 20,000 meters square, to supply the, the 20 megawatts of power. And, uh, and that's assuming 100% efficiency, but as we know, there's no such thing as 100% efficiency. And, uh, and therefore, like, you know, if the, if the efficiency was 20%, then you would need 20, like, you know, 20 software fields. And, uh, and any one of us who have gone to one software, to watch soccer game, we can imagine like, you know, like uh, 20 of these soccer fields and how large that area would be, whereas, you know, I could fill my car like in a bucket, like, you know, within no time. So it gives a feel for how dilute the solar energy is, and which is kind of a good thing, right? Because uh, it is dilute, so we can go out and we don't get burnt. But from an engineering perspective, our, our raw material or the, whether our raw energy supply is very dilute. And, and that has big repercussions because uh, what that would mean is that to get certain amount of energy, like I need a very large land area and, uh, and the equipment used for, for collection also must be very low cost, right? Because I'm recovering a very large amount of area. And if the cost per unit area has to be very, very low, otherwise uh, it will not cut it. Right? And the second problem was that the, which I also quickly realized is that the, that the energy on top of that, not that the, for a given amount of energy, not only we need large area, but the amount of energy we use is also quite large. Okay, like for example, for for United States, this is hundred quarts, and uh, and um, and the quart is ten to fifteen BTU, and one BTU is roughly a kilojoule. Just because the United States, we people do live in in old energy units, but uh, so so BTU think of it as kilojoules for for today's discussion. And, and that is equivalent to 800 billion gallons of gasoline equivalent energy. And uh, what that means in the United States, every human being who, is, who lives in the United States is consuming on an average of 6.7 gallons of gasoline equivalent every, every day. And, uh, and I don't even drink 6.7 gallons of water every day. So, so it gives a kind of a feel like I was telling you about 10 gallons per unit time and, and each individual in the United States is every day by the time they wake up and they go to bed, they would have consumed close to 6.7 gallons of uh, gasoline equivalent of energy. So it's very large, okay? And, and India's energy use, for example, in 2020 was a little bit less than 2019, but uh, nevertheless, it was 37 quarts. So just to give you a feel, like it is roughly 40% of the United States uh, total energy used in 2019. So. So it's still quite large, even though it is, given the population, it is quite low, but nevertheless, it is quite large. Okay? So the energy use is very large. And, uh, and so what that means is that we, one has to cover large land area actually to, to recover the solar energy. And for example, for UK, I will show you later, it could very well be UK and Germany, they might have to cover 25% of them, their land area 
if they were to supply all the energy by using solar energy. So land constraint implies like uh, how you collect solar radiation is will play a very vital role in the future of this of the human civilization. And, uh, and to top it off, solar energy is intermittent, as we all know, like uh, in most part of the world, it is available only 20% of the time. And uh, in India, maybe 25% of the time, but, but, but certainly it is a very small fraction. And so it needs storage. And also not only storage, the second problem is as, a, as, a, as the engineers, whatever plants we build, like, you know, it works 24 hours. Like if you build a steel plant or if you build a cement plant or if you build a petrol, petroleum refinery, they work 24 hours, so 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 the, the return of the capital is continuous. Whereas here, the return of the capital is uh, is only 20 percent of the time. So if I build a photovoltaic farm, like uh, and if I sink my capital, 80 percent of the time it is sitting idle, making no product. So what that means is there's a further cost constraint besides needing the storage. So so those are the quite the challenges. And uh, now I'm going to switch, and I'm going to. Then I'll, after that, I will just give you a journey about the, my, my research with the biofuels and I will give you a different context of it. So, so that time I was thinking how to harness solar energy, where should I go, what problem should I tackle? And, uh, and then I realized that solar energy can be harnessed in several forms, right? So it, you can grow biomass, if you, you can make hydrogen out of it, you can produce electricity, you can use concentrators, produce heat. So what I did was I was debating where should I focus my research. So I began to look into all those four areas. And, uh, and uh, what I realized to was that if you look at the solar photons and if you're looking at the energy recovery from it, electricity can be recovered at very high efficiency. Like today you can buy PV panels, which, are, which could be close to 20% efficiencies. And of course, if you use concentrators, you can get uh, any of the solar radius were direct, not diffused, and uh, then, then you could collect it at a very high efficiency at very high temperatures with very high exergy content. And of course, if you can make electricity with 20% efficient, electrolyzers can make 12% efficient hydrogen. But to the surprise of me at that point, but now I know it fairly well, but that time that the efficiency of the biomass is was was roughly one percent for harnessing solar energy and sugarcane ganda in India, which is one of the highest efficiency you know crop. Okay, even that has the efficiency of close to only one percent in the neighborhood of one percent. And so what that means is that if I'm growing biomass as an energy source, okay, I would need ten times the more land area actually because. Uh, even 20 times the more land area. And I already told you that solar energy is dilute and, and even with 20% efficiency, we need large land areas. So, so, so it became very clear to me very early on to, to focus on biomass as an energy source for the long term, even though for the majority of its existence, human race has lived out of biomass, but that's why the population was small actually. And, uh, and of course, if I took biomass and tried to make a liquid fuel out of it, the process, chemical process of conversion has 50 to 70% efficiency, that that 1% becomes then 0.5 to 0.7% efficiency. So the biomass to liquid fuel did not look like a viable option. So, so I, I thought that, but nevertheless, I will like, uh, if the order of magnitude less efficient biomass is, okay. And so if you wanted, like there were a lot of biomass will be needed. So I did a couple of calculations that time and I will quickly share results with you is, uh, is if you look at, at what I call sustainably available biomass. So what is sustainably available biomass? Basically, SA biomass is like, for example, if you're growing ganna, then from, from ganna you can, after the, the juice has been collected, the bagasse which is left behind would be a SA biomass because uh, you're not using extra fertilizer, you're not using extra land, you're not using any extra resources to get to the biomass. And, uh, and could that biomass be converted to liquid fuel? And if yes, what would you get? In the United States, it will be, it will be the leftovers after the corn has been, corn kernels have been collected and, and so forth, okay? And so, so calculation shows that if we take SA biomass and we convert it to, to liquid fuel, like or any chemicals, like, you know, let's call it fuel for the time being. And if you use the standalone processes where biomass comes and it is converted just like sugar to alcohol or whatever have you, and uh, what the early modeling research showed to us was that in, no matter what process we used, whether it was gasification, pressure cross, fermentation, hydrothermal gasification, pyrolysis, hydro treating, so we modeled all those processes. 
And to our surprise that all those processes recovered only 40% of the biomass as liquid fuels. Okay. And uh, a liquid fuel, I mean molecules which have the same energy density as gasoline or diesel. And uh, meaning they are free of oxygen and only 40% of the carbon was recovered. And the rest of the carbon, meaning 60% of the carbon which came with the biomass went back to that monster. Okay. And uh, so, so the question was like, okay, so in, in the United States, we have SA biomass of roughly half a billion tons per year. And, uh, and the transportation fuel use is roughly 30 million barrels a day. And if we took all this 500 million tons of year per year of biomass and converted it to, to gasoline, it will be roughly 2 million barrels, which is a very small fraction of like 30 to 40 million barrels. So, so certainly the, if we were to rely on biomass, like, you know, liquid fuel will need a lot more liquid fuel than a than, uh, lot more biomass than is available sustainably. And so, but before we do that, before we do that, I already told you that uh, heat and uh, sorry, electricity and hydrogen could be recovered by an order of magnitude higher efficiency. So rather than growing more biomass to make liquid fuel, like, you know, we asked the question that uh, why not, uh, so why is that carbon recovery 40%? The recovery of the carbon is 40% because Biomass has 35% oxygen. And what that means is the energy per content of carbon in a biomass is, uh, is roughly one third, sorry, roughly like, you know, I would say like it's only 60% of the energy, which is per carbon atom in the gasoline or diesel, right? Because there's no oxygen there. Those molecules are not partially oxidized. So, so in the process of conversion, what we're doing is we're increasing the energy content per carbon atom. And since we're increasing the energy content per carbon atom, the first law tells us is that if you want to preserve all the carbon which came with the biomass and, and have to show us, we have to supply energy to the system. And the best way to supply energy to the system is what is recovered at higher efficiencies, such as electricity and hydrogen. And so that uh, we have additional energy to store on the backbone of carbon and produce the fuel. And so this way, 100% of the biomass carbon recovery would be possible. And, uh, and we, we did a lot of experiments and we published a lot of research in those days. And uh, that was like taking biomass and taking a hydrogen from a carbon free source. We did a lot of experiments and time does not allow today for me to go in detail. So otherwise that could itself be an hour talk. And so I'm going to just let you know that we did experiments with fast hydropyrolysis and hydro deoxygenation with my colleagues at, at Purdue. And, uh, and we produce alkanes directly from the reactor actually. And the CO2 was recycled and hydrogen followed by catalytic deoxygenation upgraded the fuel. And the goal was not to release any, any CO2 back to the atmosphere. So biomass carbon, we learned very quickly, actually, actually I learned very quickly that biomass carbon can be used for chemicals, but we better not use it for energy because that would be a losing gain in the long run. Especially use of biomass to produce heat or electricity or hydrogen is not sustainable in the long term in the context of the energy used by the human civilization. And, uh, and, and also, like if we if we if we imagine like uh, the we say that the carbon content in the atmosphere is is very high because of the environmental warming and so forth, but that concentration is only 415 parts per million. And as a chemical engineer, to me, 415 parts per million is very low concentration if I'm going to recover it as my feedstock. Because uh, the way I imagine is is as I was taught in my undergraduate in in, in L7 is that is if. Uh, if there are a million molecules passing by me, and uh, if all the molecules are green in color, and there are 415 molecules which are red in color, and if, I, if someone gave me a beaker and a forcep, and if my job was to catch those 50, 415 red, red balls and put it in the beaker, okay, I would get bored actually, basically, and tropically very unfavorable process. And, uh, and what that means is that, uh, but Mother Nature has done exactly that. It uh, captured those 415 red balls and gave me in the form of leaves and, 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 uh, and wood and, and uh, twigs and so forth. And therefore to put it back in the atmosphere is absolutely not justified. So, so, so the way I look at it is biomass is a carbon source, not an energy source. And we should make use of that carbon to produce chemicals and so forth. Okay. 
And the other, other thing which I realized by the same token, okay, as, as you can see from a running thread so far, that hydrogen and electricity could be recovered at much higher efficiencies. And the major thing is that if we look to biomass as a carbon source, then what that means is that biomass can provide the carbon and the hydrogen and electricity along with the heat, of course, can do almost anything we want, right? Because we can make fertilizers, we can make urea, we can make ammonia, we can make almost all the major chemicals which the human race uses, okay? And cooking and purifying purification of water, mobility, energy storage. So there's a whole slew of things which can be done. So, so I decided that I'm going to focus on, on the electricity in my research, okay? And, uh, and this is how I reached to my, my conclusion that that's the fruitful area where as a, as a chemical engineer, I could go in and, uh, and begin to focus. And, uh, and that was the, so I decided to start my research in, um, in solution process solar cells, even though that point in time, that subject was quite alien to me, but I figured that that was the right thing to do. So I began to look at the solar cells. And, and as I began to look at the solar cells, like, you know, I realized like, so I'm going to could use one of them as an example where I have focused a lot of my time, which is covering the gallium diacelenide. Of course, a solar cell is a, is a thin film device with multiple layers and having the electric field inside. Light is absorbed, holes and electrons are separated, they run outside and the influence of electric field and the circuit is over. So I started to focus and absorber is the place where most of the light is absorbed and the, and the electron and holes are created. So I started to envision my research focusing on the low cost absorber layer. And uh, for the low cost, like uh, even today, the world's most of the solar cells are not produced by printing. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so how, how about uh, given my background in chemical engineering, I decided that maybe I should formulate the inks to print the to print on a roll to roll solar cells for different layers, like in this case, copper, indium, gallium, diacelenide, let us say, put the absorber layer, come along, put the cadmium sulfide, the N, N layer, intrinsic zinc oxide, put the transparent conductive oxide grids, and so forth. So, so I started to focus on the printed solar cells and uh, solution process solar cells. And I gave Deepika a choice that uh, should I talk on the, on the, on the, I could have given you a very easy, uh, you know, multiple hour talk on the solar cells. I would love to talk about it because this subject is quite dear and dear to me. And when Ashish visits us, I will probably bore him a little bit with, uh, with through my lab and what research we are doing on this subject. So, but anyway, the bottom line is we are focused on primarily on the absorber layer. And we, in my lab, we take two approaches to make, uh, make solar cells. First is uh, we make nanoparticles, we suspend them in the ink and, uh, and we print them. And, uh, and, uh, and then we deposit it, we heat it like, you know, and we, can, we have multiple coaters in the lab. And, and, uh, and then we have a cross section of the nice thin film for the semiconducting materials. Then we can grow large grains, we can finish device. And we can measure their optoelectronic properties after that. An entire thing can be done in my lab, actually, from the left to the to the right, including the material as well as optoelectronic factorization of the materials. And, and the second route is where we don't make nanoparticles, we directly dissolve the molecular precursors. And in this case, we could dissolve, for example, copper sulfide, indium, gallium directly, and selenium directly into the solvents. We discovered some solvents which can do that. And, uh, and we can print and, and, and print the device. And uh, from my lab, we have, uh, to this date, uh, to my understanding, we still be, my lab holds the record of the highest CIGSC efficiency from the nanoparticle inks, okay, which is 15% total area and 16.2% active area efficiency. And still it is from the nanoparticle ink that is still the highest efficiency. And, and uh, but, uh, for the last uh, last 10 years, the lab is also focused on uh, making cells from the earth abundant materials, like for example, copper, indium, gallium. Indium is not as earth abundant. And in that spirit, we have focused quite a bit in uh, on, uh, early on we focused on copper, zinc, tin, sulfur, selenite, solar cells. And though Sarang is also busy with doing copper, zinc, tin, sulfide, solar cells. And we also did back in 2009, we started a research on that. And uh, we made a lot of progress. We, we made 9.3% efficient solar cell very early on. And uh, however, this material is inherently defective. 
And, uh, and I would not go into the reasons why it is. We did a lot of analysis and to our disappointment, we did find that uh, like, you know, it is quite defective material. And therefore we have, uh, we have stopped working on it as of today. And, uh, but we never, we tried many, many materials that time actually, we doped it with germanium, we alloyed it with germanium, we doped it with silver, we alloyed it with silver, we made copper arsenic sulfides and then so forth. Lately, my lab is involved in making chalcogenite perovskites, okay, and uh, by solution processing such as barium zirconium trisulfide, barium hafnium trisulfide. We are pretty excited. This is a very new thing in my lab. We have done in the last one year and we have succeeded in making them. So we are thrilled actually. And because these should be stable as against the halite perovskites and early indications are, yes, they are stable. So, so that's where the where half of my lab is, uh, is focused right now and, uh, and so forth, okay. And the search continues, okay. And, and uh, in the remaining time, I, I will go. I will visit back the land constraints. So while we are doing all this research, it kept bugging me, and I visited uh, with, with Manju, my wife. Actually, I visited uh, Kerala, and we went to the Bonar Hills, and uh, probably one of the most beautiful places I have been to. Look, looking at those tea gardens, and both of us were standing there, and uh, I was lost in the beauty of the nature, actually. And uh, and suddenly a thought came out of no nowhere. That's such a beautiful place, and uh, and uh, if they needed electricity, how would they do that? Actually, because you know those hills are rolling hills, right? and uh, lovely scenic hills, and uh, there's no place to be done because uh, that would hurt them. And on the journey back, on the, when I took journey from New Delhi back to to Newark, I spent the entire time on the plane thinking about it. Drew a lot of schemes, a lot of photovoltaic cells, which. So the question I posed to myself during that trip, during that uh, so-called vacation or holiday, whatever you'd like to call it, is that uh, how would Munar get its electricity and how the photovoltaics could be, could play a role. So, so that started my electric farming, introduction to electric farming. And, uh, and uh, so, 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 so that was like 2015, 2015 when I had visited the, the Munar Hills. And uh, so after coming back from there, like began to look at what is the, what is the actual, by this time, by 2015, there's enough solar farms which have been built in the world, like you know, so PV and uh, what is their electrical output, right? So, so what this is what this shows is power per unit area from solar farms around the world. There's a lot more data if you go to the source there, but, and you can find more source from the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, all over the world. And, but just for the illustration, this graph, I intentionally took out a lot of points and there are only a few points which are shown. So let me tell you what X axis is and what Y axis is. So X axis is the solar irradiation insulation. Okay, and as you can notice, it runs only up to 220 watts per meter square as against the thousand watts per meter square, which I showed you earlier. The reason for that is because this energy is on a 24 hour average, not instant average. So, and since solar sun is out only 20% of the time. So what happens is that thousand watts becomes 200 watts. Okay, so, so it is based on the, based on the average because the, the logic here is that we as a human race use energy 24 hours. And therefore, let's talk on the basis of 24 hours rather than when the sun is out. Okay, and same thing, power per unit area. So basically, what the, how much power is produced based on the unit area of that solar phone. Okay, so the solar insulation, meaning how many watts per meter square based on the 24 hour. Same thing, power per unit area based on the 24 hours. Because some of you must be wondering why 10 watts looks very low, but of course it is. Remember, it is it is one fifth of what it would be if the sun was being out. Had, and you can't cover all the solar, all the land with PV because uh, there are a lot of land which is wasted because you, you can't allow the land to have shadow from one to the other. And with that, what you find is that the places, northern places like UK have very low power per unit area, like five watts per meter square. On the other hand, uh, other hand, uh, in US is all kind of all kind of variations. But the bottom line is what you find is that the solar farms in Northern Europe is roughly five watts per meter square, right? That's what we saw. And Southern like Spain, like, you know, which is India will be somewhere here, I would say like more like, more like India has its own challenges with PV, which we can talk later on, but between seven to 10 watts per meter square could be India, okay? And you know, of course, the United States, we have all the way from, 
from 5 to 11. So the maximum is around 11, 11 watts per meter square and average is around seven. And, uh, and the, most of the places in Northern Europe will be five watts per meter square. So why do we need those numbers? The reason we need those numbers is because once we know what's the power production from a solar farm based on a unit area for a given country, then what we can do is we can ask how much power they are consuming based on their total land area. Right? So, so we know how much energy is consumed in a year, and therefore we can calculate on a 24 hour basis, we can translate how many watts that is, how much power that translates into, we know the land area of that country, and therefore we can know how many watts per meter square of that country of the energy is being consumed. So if you look for UK and Germany, what you find is, is they, their population consumes roughly 1.25 watts per meter square equivalent of power. And if the solar farms are producing only five watts, that means these countries will have to recover 25% of their land area, okay? So that's not gonna happen. There's really no way that a 25% empty land is available in a country, in a densely populated country like UK or, or, or Germany, in fact. And how about India? Okay, so so last night I did some quick calculations for India. As a matter of fact, I have a guy from from IIT Kanpur, like Subhanshu, and he has done a lot of extensive calculation. Actually, I have to encourage him to publish this paper, which is my fault. Actually, I have not done that. But uh, what you are going to see, which we, which one of my guy did in the context of the United States when Subhanshu arrived last year in January, in he took one of my classes and he did those calculations and I need to I need to uh, along with the another student like Catherine, so both of them have them have done for India. But nevertheless, last night I quickly did some my own math and uh, India's power requirement is roughly 0.375 watts per meter square. And if you look at the land area and the total energy, that means four percent of the country's land area must be covered with solar farms if India wants to meet all its needs with the solar energy. However, I have to caution here, this 4% is really not the number because India's per capita energy consumption as of today is roughly one tenth of the world or, or half. So what that means is that as India continues to move, eventually its energy consumption catches up, okay? And, uh, and if it doesn't increase by a factor of 10, certainly it will increase by a factor of four, okay? And uh, so what that means is that 4% could become 15 to 20% of the India's land area. So remember, we are not talking of tomorrow. We are not talking 20 years from now. We are talking 1,000 years from now, okay? So th this is for the human civilization. How the human, all of us who are transiting from this, this planet, we are here only for a short period of time. And we need to think in the context of the human civilization and the time period at which, uh, like, you know, from as, um, as, we, as we travel through this, this planet, actually. And uh, so, so the consumption and how about the US, okay? So US average power requirement is 0.43 watts per meter square. And what that means, just like India, like, a, like the US will need four to 6% of its land to, to supply the PV. But let's closely examine it. What are the repercussions? So of course, the United States is a, big, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a bigger country and most of the solar energy is, is in Southwest of the United States, okay? And most of the other parts of the United States don't have such a high solar irradiation. So, so what that means is uh, we will have, in the United States, one will have to produce the energy in one corner of the country and, and uh, transport it to the other corners. And that would require trillions of dollars of investment and uh, high voltage grids will be needed, large investment in the infrastructure. But the question is, can we take advantage of the fact that the solar energy is everywhere, right? So local photons for local use, okay? So what this allows us to ask ourselves the question, which is very different from the fossils, which would move around with the tankers and, uh, and the rail cars and so forth around the world and, uh, and within a country and the pipelines, but the solar energy is locally available and what are the repercussions of that? Okay, so we began to look into that and uh, we began to look, uh, this was again, like after coming from Munaf, like uh, that was one of the early days. And uh, so we started to ask those questions and did calculations. And I look at the clocks of the time is running. So I will go a little bit faster, just, but, the, but to sum it up, what we did was we just can't take the total energy a country is consuming and translate into the solar energy just the way I showed you earlier, because uh, in the fossil world, the way we use energy and we all are familiar with the second law of thermodynamics, right? So when we transfer it into electricity, there's something called Carnot efficiency. So there's only a certain fraction of the energy is being used, constructively used actually, and a lot of it is, is wasted to the atmosphere. Whereas in the in the renewable world, we are already getting electricity, which is the highest form, which is exerting equivalent actually. So 
So we can't take 100 units of energy in a fossil and put it 100 units of electricity. That would be like comparing apples with oranges or mangoes with amroots, okay, arm with amroots or whatever. Okay, so, so we need to look at it a little bit differently. So what that means is in the current Current system with uh, with natural gas and petroleum and coal, we meet all our needs. And in the in the future world, by the way, I'm not talking about wind here. Wind is implicitly included in the solar. Okay, just to keep up my talk simple. So I don't want anyone to say that we have bias against wind. Wind will also play a big role, but uh, wind is not available everywhere. And since solar is available everywhere, that's why I have been focusing on solar so far. So with the elements of solar, water, and biomass, water for the hydrogen, biomass for the carbon, solar for the, for the electricity and heat, okay, if we go that, and we can look for every need we have. And for example, for the light duty vehicles for cars, what we can ask is how much, uh, how much uh, petroleum or gasoline is being used okay, to, to drive a car. If, and if the internal combustion engine has a 15% efficiency, we can, we can calculate what is the actual energy output constructed constructively used and then we can do the same thing for solar if we produce electricity what are the transmission losses like you know like 4.7 percent transmission losses storage motor efficiency and 75 percent use and then we can equate the two and then we'll know for every 100 units of petroleum like you know how many units of solar energy would be needed and we can do those calculations for all the sectors from residential chemical production in-house industry and so forth. And, and this is a very detailed calculation. And then we can conclude that total end power use is United States is 665 gigawatts, which is the end use, okay? which is not the fossil, but this is what, and this is what the solar energy will have to supply. Now that solar energy has to supply all that, what does that mean? So if you look at in the United States, I told you 4% of the land area might be needed, but now what happens is the urban land area in the United States is 3.2% of the total. And the miscellaneous land area, meaning deserts, the barren land, and so forth, is roughly 3.6. And the agricultural land area is 54%. And land area for the special use is 9%. Forest use is 30.4. So what do we learn from here? What we learn from here is the is almost the entire land is agricultural land and the forest land, right? Okay. And of course, the, no one would like to destroy Yellowstone National Park or the Grand Canyon for that matter. Okay, or in India, for example, Rajaji's Park, like, you know, or the Munar Hills, which I just talked about, okay. Those are the areas you really don't want to touch. Those are the national, what I call jewels, okay. So, so what that means is that the land area, which is really available, is quite low. I don't know today about IIT Kanpur, but when I was an undergraduate at IIT Kanpur, like uh, from the campus, if you walk out of the campus, it was all farmland area, actually. It was all, all cave after cave after cave after cave. There was no empty land. Okay, and uh, so my recollection of that era is that, and even today where I live, like outside, so in winter, it might look like an empty line, but by the time Ashish arrives, like, you know, all around when we'll see it, like uh, it is all it is corn and soybean, okay? So there's no empty land per se. And uh, so the area which is available to put the photovoltaics is either in the, in the cities, in the urban land area or the miscellaneous land area. And there are many studies which have been done to see what fraction of the urban land area you could use for PV. And by various measures, it is between 1% to 12% because you can't put PV everywhere and the cast shadows and it has to face sun and, uh, and, and the mini constraints. And uh, of course the miscellaneous land area, the same thing. So we did some quick calculations under many scenarios and I will share with you one scenario. So if you were to use 5% of the urban land area for solar and 50% of the miscellaneous land area, then how does the picture look for each of the states? Because remember, it is local photons for local needs. And since we're looking at the local, so we did calculations. We did very extensive calculations as to if every state for, I live in the state of Indiana right here, okay? And uh, so if Indiana wanted to meet all its energy needs by its local solar energy, what will it take? And if you were to build the farms, so, so if I took 5% of the urban land area, and if I took 50% of the miscellaneous area, what would be the, what power output would I need from my solar farm? And that is more than 11 watts per meter square, okay? So, so and, and I told you earlier, the most solar farms don't produce more than 11 watts per meter square. So what that means is that I don't have enough land area. And so United States, if local energy is being to be met, 24 of the states will require more than 11 watts per meter square to meet the local energy needs. Okay? And that, what that means is that 24% of the states are, do not have enough land to meet their local energy with the solar. So, 
So what does that mean? That means if they wanted to meet the local energy need with solar energy, they will have to put these so these PVs on the agricultural land area. So there's a competition between land for land between food and energy. And of course, if people like me will rather have my food, I would rather have my 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 rice and uh, and sabji rather than the power to my my iPhone, right? So, well, that's a joke because we need both in today's world. But uh, but so the catch is if we were to put in the agricultural land what fraction of the agricultural land would be used locally. And uh, we did a lot of calculations for that. And for example, the state of Indiana, where I am, okay, I, they will end up using roughly 15% of the land area of, of the agricultural land area, which is a smaller fraction of the land area, but nevertheless, you, one is going to be using TV in the agricultural land. But if we did that, it can meet all the land area. And the situation would be quite similar for India, by the way. Okay, I, I think it's basically, 100 years from now, as India has moved and its energy consumption per person has gone up, like, you know, it is, it is bound to happen that way. And so that got me into eclectic farming. Okay, so that was like 2000. So it took us a year for my graduate students to do the number crunching and do the modeling. And then after that, we decided, okay, we're going to take this and start doing a research. So what I call agriculture and agricultural electricity production, eclectic, PV eclectic, because it is PV, you could have wind eclectic farming, you can have PV eclectic farming. And so what's the challenge? The challenge is if you put photovoltaics on agricultural lines, if they cast shadows and the photosynthesis activities, it is the same visible part of the spectrum from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometers, which is, I learned very quickly, which is exactly the same spectrum which our eyes use, is the same spectrum which the, which the PV use, uh, which the plants use. And that's not a surprise, that's the maximum in the solar radiation from the sun. So over the evolution of the planet Earth, like we, all the species have evolved using that maximum, maximum wavelength, uh, the maximum wavelength, like the photons in that, uh, in that window with the maximum concentration. And, uh, and so for the farming, for example, like, you know, you can see here, these panels are casting shadows and there is a output decline actually. So, so, so like showing current free designs, uh, conclusion is they, they cost shadow and, uh, and the crop yields and, 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 the, and the 10 to 20% decline in the food production would be tremendous actually. So what we did was we did a lot of calculations, which I'm not going to bore you with, like how the PV panels should be mounted, what their shadows look like, dynamic shadow versus the static shadows and different designs and so forth. And the upshot is in the interest of time is that we did build it. We went ahead and we, we produced a big, not only a big engineering school, like, uh, but we are like, uh, so like, uh, but Purdue is a, is, a, is a big agriculture university also. And, uh, and uh, so what, have, what that means is that there's a, we have a lot of colleagues in agriculture department who are world-class agronomists. So I knocked on, on their doors and some of them were kind enough to come forward and collaborate. So Purdue has a big farm, like, uh, which is formed under agri actual agriculture practices. And so we did install these east-west tracking panels, which are 20 feet high in the air in 2019. So it took us three years to, to collect money and build these things. And here it is like, you know, we are growing corn and uh, east-west tracking, as you can see corn at the bottom, which is all lined up actually. And uh, by November, we have a snow. We were talking about the weather earlier, like you know, it does get cold by that time, but, um, but the plants are harnessed. The point I would like to tell you is very laborious. Like we collected individual data on throughout the plant, like 1500 to 1800 plants, 1900 plants. Every two weeks, students went in, collected their height, leaves, silking, anthesis, baits, and when did the crop up, how the height changed. Corn ears were collected individually, how many cons in the kernel, what's the density, what's the yield. Very laborious job, but we have done it for three seasons. Quickly showing you the data. In 2019, we were, we were very late in, in planting. We planted in June, so we had to plant a hybrid seed, which was for a small season. And what we find was found out was for those seeds, the shadows did not matter. The yield was roughly the same, okay? Average yield was roughly the same. However, in 2020, we planted the normal seed, okay, which for the long duration, and we found a 8% decline in the yield with, without PV and with PV. So, so there is a decline and we are doing a lot of modeling right now. And uh, with that modeling, we are trying to understand how to increase the electrical output without hurting the yield from the plant. And hopefully in, in, in six months or so, we will have our early results for publication. So what's the vision here? The vision here is, of course, we've got the, the agriculture farms, okay, and you've got the PV panels and you've got the, the wind, maybe wind farms. 
and uh, you produce electricity and, and biomass gives you the carbon source. You make hydrogen and then you can produce locally chemical distributed plants. Chemical engineers have to rethink what they're doing. And similarly, the material scientists who are in the steel production, cement production, metal production, have to rethink how they purify the metal without the coke and, uh, and with the help of electricity. We have to reimagine the entire manufacturing sector. We can locally produce and then we can locally have the needs being met okay, by for the pure water and so forth. Basically, a distribu distribu distributed plants and on a small scale and meeting local needs with, uh, with uh, local local solar energy actually. So, in, so that sums up where, where we are today. Okay, so I think for a sustainable future, we have to learn how to use solar energy. And uh, it provides a lot of unique opportunities to us because suddenly we have local photons and local energy source, which we can use to meet local needs. We don't have to rely on, on the different nations to give us the energies. And uh, however, there's a lot of challenges as we discussed. And I think in my mind, the primary challenge is the solar energy being very diluted, meaning very large areas would be needed. And, and, and then coupled with this intermittency and the storage, like both of them are probably the single most challenge. And, uh, and I do believe that uh, we, if we learn how to make electricity and, and hydrogen in an economical fashion from this and learn how to store them, like uh, they can, we can do anything what we have learned to do with the fossils. And, uh, and uh, because of the dilute nature, there is a land constraint and competition with the agriculture and we must begin to solve that problem today rather than, uh, rather than leave it, leave it for, for the later time. And, uh, and, uh, and, and what that means is someone like me who is in chemical engineering, and I'm sure it is true for, for most branches of engineering, except maybe the electrical engineering is that once we have this, Okay, how do we do all the things we have learned to do with fossils and what we do with the renewable electricity and the hydrogen? And what that means is reimagining the, all the, the processes, the steps and, uh, and how the things have been done. And uh, so that's how I look at this uh, very exciting scenario actually, because uh, I find this very fascinating. And uh, with that, I would like to finish my talk thanking all my guys and the team and uh, they are the ones who are really cranking the output and uh, I get to present it. And uh, with that, thanks to all of you. I know you late in the day and uh, listening to me patiently and uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. It was quite an interesting presentation and we all enjoyed it a lot. So we thoroughly enjoyed and got to know a lot of new concepts which we were not aware about earlier. So thank you so much uh, for delivering such an interesting talk. So now from the audience, I would uh, request like whosoever has a question, they can raise their hand, then one by one we may ask them to pose it. Kindly raise your hand. Uh, yeah, Jitendra, you go ahead, please. Thank you, Professor Agrawal. Uh, it was really a wonderful talk. Uh, I have, I just wanted to know your views on the material, like who actually can compete with the, which material can compete with the silicon, like for example, CIGS and CDT, they uh, were able to get to 20%, which is good for a commercial application, but still we do not see, like, do you really see any material which can replace the silicon or actually can actually challenge to some extent to play like some market share? So that, that's, a, that's a very, very good question, by the way. Silicon is very entrenched and 95% of the solar cells are silicon and they will continue to be like that. But however, I do believe that other materials can challenge. That's why I trust of my research. So regarding CIGSC, the, the problem, so CIGSC in the lab have achieved 23% now. So, so the, but the problem with that is, is the manufacturing problem. Like uh, it's uh, very difficult to get uh, CIGC uniformly over a large area substrate. And uh, so what that means is the inhomogeneity on the surface of as copper, indium and gallium are deposited, like, you know, with the selenium leads to variable, variability and efficiency. And what that means is the net efficiency is much lower. And, uh, and that's the reason for, for it not competing with silicon. But on the other hand, cadmium telluride competes with silicon, but it has, a, it has its own challenge, right? Some countries don't like cadmium because of being, uh, being uh, you know, elements of hydrogen means the tellurium is very, very null, like, you know, the 
metal. So, so that also produces a constraint. But cadmium telluride, first of all, can produce a reasonable efficiency, that, and it can compete in cost with the with the with silicon. But you're absolutely right. Like so silicon is entrenched, and uh, so the day like you know halite perovskites could have competed, but they're unstable right now. So that has been their Achilles heel. But uh, sooner or later, if they solve that problem, they could compete with. Uh, I think they could compete with silicon. But but I do believe that the search continues. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens, and um, and that's why I'm working not on chalcogenite perovskites. All indications are their oxide electronic properties are quite good. And uh, now, but it comes with those backs of challenges, you know, as uh, I, so as they, those are crossed and hopefully we will come up with some. Hopefully we will come up with some. Uh, Professor Gautam Dev, you have a question? Yeah, uh, hi Rakesh, uh, uh, this is Gautam. Uh, we are meeting after a long time. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 always I get interested. Unfortunately, I wasn't there in the beginning of the talk. But uh, when you came down with, with one of your conclusion is that you have to have uh, in a in a quantum of, of land uh, uh, area, you have to distribute your uh, energy production, your chemical production, your living. Uh, do you have any idea how uh, what fractions of these would be an ideal setup, or or is that something still being worked out? It depends upon the efficiencies of each, and you know that 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 is a bit more complicated than a, a but a rough you know thumb rule which you would. Uh... So like it depends on the crops, like you know, and I showed you like even for the corn, like two different seeds give two different performance. And uh, so, but the thing is, is is uh, is kind of like we're doing a lot of detailed modeling right now. We are using Epsim, which is a crop model, okay, and there's Ep and we are using Epsim for crop model for the corn. But if, in the Indian context, if it is rice or uh, or the or gehun, then you know, then. Uh, then what that would mean is like you know, we'll have to do their Epsim calculations and uh, and see how the shadows are interacting with the the light intensity. So, so the things which we are studying right now is you know what part of the growing stage of the plant we can steal more photons from the plant, okay, or what time of the day we can steal the photons so that the the plant still gives us the same yield as it would give without the without that. So. And also, this is also what kind of PV panels should we design and install, and how do we track the sun on, or untrack the sun? Let's say both, okay, during the daytime. So it's quite, quite, uh, quite an interesting research. Let's put it this way: okay, understand the photosynthesis in coupled with the with the, with the PV part is the easier part. It is the it is the photosynthesis part. How to how to make sure the plant goes through all their stages. And of course, it will be different for different, uh, different crops. So right now we are focused on, uh, on corn and last year we did some soybean. And because I live in Midwest and that's where those are the only two crops, we, you know, it's not wheat or it is not rice. So, but nevertheless, like uh, in Indian context, like uh, I think the similar research needs to be done in detail with the Epsom modeling and so forth. And, uh, so we are still trying to understand. So I really, it's not a not a straightforward forward answer. Let's put it this way. And and obviously, ultimately, what you want to do is you want to couple it with the weather forecast. Okay. And uh, depending on whether today is going to be cloudy day or a sunny day or what stage of the plant is, have models. We just, just like we do in time control. Okay. That's that's what it will evolve. Like just like a plant control. Like we, we that's what we do in chemical plants, for example. Like you know online control and, and it will be similar to that coupled with the so it's quite an interesting problem by the way it's quite an interesting yeah. problem several levels of optimization required oh yes absolutely and, and more important understanding the, both the biology and the physics at the same time like you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. makes it yeah. quite interesting thank you thank you professor Dale. i think professor Gurg, you can ask your question okay yeah uh, professor agrawal very nice talk i think this is something which uh, many of us who work in photovoltaics uh, uh, sort of uh, appreciate that you know there is a, there is a competition between land and and uh, other resources that we want to get from the land. So my question is about when you raise these solar panels above the ground uh, to reduce the shadowing effect, uh, what is the increase in the cost of installation and eventually the cost? Ah, of very very good question actually. So so. It's not viable, right? The cost is very high, right? Because uh, because uh, right now the one I showed is 20 feet high in the air, right? 
And the biggest problem with Bitwest is we could we had to design it for a wind speed of 120 miles per hour, even though it, it happens once in five years or 10 years, but you need to design it for that wind speed. And, uh, and what that means is the foundation has to be very strong. You just can't just go and put it, right? So what we have done, Ashish, is in the last five years, we have been playing with a lot of designs to reduce the height, okay? to bring it closer to the ground. And, and, uh, and let's see how those they work out. So once we have successfully stimulated the current, what we have, and we have learned, then our next goal is to stimulate different PV designs and operations Okay, we should enable us to bring it as close to the ground as possible. Okay. So that's a, of course, if, in case of Khan, since, the, or for example, in India, Ghana, like, you know, if the height itself is seven, eight feet, you can't bring it yeah. below eight right, feet. Right, okay. Right. okay, but for the wheat and rice, certainly they can be brought much, much right. lower height. Okay, and but once you bring lower height, the shadow intensity increases, and then the issue is how do you operate it? Okay. The PE panel, okay, to decrease the interference with the crop. Mm -hmm. Right. So, in addition to this agri, um, I mean, I like this term agro agrilectic farming, but <laughs> to agrilectic farming uh, nowadays there is a lot of discussion about this BIPV, BIPV as well as transparent solar cells because a lot of buildings in countries like India are now glass-based buildings. So as a result, people are talking about semi-transparent solar cells which allow electricity as well as light. Mm -hmm. I have be generated. So what is your sort of take on the BIPV and semi-transparent photovoltaic? Okay, so, so the bifacial certainly, yes. Okay, bifacials are very important because they recover more energy. Okay. And, uh, but when it comes to the electric farming or agri-voltaic farming, whatever you like to call it, like I believe you we were just talking about the cost of installation. And that's the substantial portion of the cost, okay? Right. And, uh, and if you build transparent, why is it transparent? It is transparent only because you're not absorbing all the solar photons right, right. in that range, okay? And, and if you're not absorbing all the solar photons, that means you cut the electricity production by that factor. Right, okay? right. And, and so that means your cost has just gone up by that factor. Mm -hmm. okay? and, uh, and I don't think that's gonna happen, okay? Mm -hmm. on, a, on a, the scale we are talking about, okay? Remember, my, if you go early, earlier part of my talk, large area has to be covered, right? right? And the cost must be very low if you really want to do it. Yeah, okay? yeah. Because even if I went and I bought like bed sheets from the from the Walmart, I still can't cover enough land in an economical fashion. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. People forget that fact. You know, this this energy, you know, Ashish, you are very thankful that this energy is valued, right? Because both of us can walk out in the sun and and, and right, just right. not get burnt. Okay. But from <laughs> as an engineer, if if we put our head as an engineer, not as a human being, then this thing is very talented. Right. And so, so I, for the buildings, it would be okay, right? Because the buildings, otherwise that that window is not being used, right? So mm -hmm. it's being, you know, so it's okay for the windows and the, to have the transparent because you get the sunlight in the room as well as, you know, you get some electricity. So that's, that's, that's mighty good. But I think for, for large scale consumption, big areas, Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are other people who want to ask questions. Thank yeah. Thank you, Professor Gar. I think Professor Shikhar Mishra, you can go ahead. Um. Hello, Professor Agarwal. Uh, it was a really you know, enlightening talk. And just to let you know, I also uh, recently did my PhD from Purdue with Dr. Hyen Wang, and I oh, briefly okay. worked with uh, Scott McClary, your student. Um, Huh? Uh, yeah, but but my question. I just, uh, so I just had a I just had a big meeting with Hyun Wang yesterday. I spent like two hours with her. So Ajay, nice. Yeah. I, so you worked on TM, I suppose, ceramic. Yeah, TM and symptom growth and all of that. Yeah, yeah. All right, nice. So uh, nice. one of the main challenges that I could see from the talk is that the solar energy requires a lot of land space. Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of long-term uh, scenario, so what would be the cost of maintenance of such uh, huge solar panels? Like in terms of you know, right now we are seeing a lot of water is required for cleaning the solar panels. And especially this would be a challenge in uh, water scarce areas. Or, you know, what would be a long-term scenario in terms of recyclability of those solar panels? So just, uh, I wanted to know your thoughts about uh, on these directions. Those, those, those are very good questions, by the way. Like, you know, it's just like the, the maintenance is uh, like you know, in India also, like, you know, with the humid environment and all people are seeing different issues than, than, for example, a dry place like in US would see. 
you know, because of the, you know, the corrosion and a uh, lot of corrosion issues with the, with the joint, with the soldering and connections that interconnect and, and there are many, many issues. And uh, so the maintenance is an issue and, uh, and that makes it exciting, right? Because what that means is that the, in the what, what should a PV panel look like in Indian context is a subject of research by itself, right? You know, because uh, of course, this, uh, what is being developed here is uh, more in the context of what works in this part of the world. So, which is, uh, so I find that quite exciting, actually, you know, that things are different, meaning us researchers have a job to do. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but as far as the maintenance is concerned, your point is very well taken. But one thing I would like to say, though, is if you do install PD panels on agricultural land, the maintenance cost does go down, okay? Because, uh, you know, just, if, it is distributed equally between, you know, you're already taking care of the of the land, right? And PV happens to be just there. It is not on its own where you have to build the infrastructure to maintain it. Okay, the same farmer who is maintaining the the, the land will maintain the PV panel. Okay, so so the, so all the studies done so far, the cost is substantially reduced for maintaining it. So because you don't have to build a new water connection if you're cleaning your PV panel with water, right? Because you already have water to supply to the plant. And, uh, and and if you do water PV panel, that water can still be used for the agricultural land. Yeah, yeah, I mean that makes okay. so 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 there are many many issues which really you know interconnected issue on the on the maintenance side actually. So that's what I would say. Right, yeah, thanks, thanks. Thank you, Professor Shikhar. Uh, Professor Kanwar, you can go ahead with your question. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello, Doctor. You are very nice talk. Hi. Uh, I myself work on solar, uh, area, solar research, solar panels. Not okay, my area of research is on perovskite solar cells, but I worked on ah. organic solar cells also earlier. So very interesting talk. I like the part where you talked about agriculture, especially. So uh, I had a like you touched upon this uh, just briefly, right? That in agriculture, uh, you can uh, there's an issue of especially in the case of India, right? Uh, in US, it's not at that much of a case where uh, panels, they develop a lot of uh, dust on them over a period of time, right? And this dust accumulates and that lowers the performance of the panels, right? Uh, your transmission goes down, your efficiency of the panel, I mean, the, the electricity that it generates, that also goes down over time, right? So there's a need to clean these panels periodically, especially in Indian scenario where there's a lot of this a uh, lot of dust, a lot of wind blows, right? If you see our panels outside, within 10 days, they can, they uh, accumulate so much dust that it mm -hmm. becomes like the panels, they work uh, like uh, at, 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 like 20% of their efficiency compared to the clean panels, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a need to clean these panels periodically. So with this agrivoltaic solution, right? You were talking about that uh, the water that we use for irrigation, right? The same water can be used for cleaning the panels also right so you're you have one stone and you're hitting two birds right <laughs> and that can i mean can 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 something like that can be adopted right is it easier to do like you use water to clean the panels and then the same water can be recycled for irrigation for the agriculture yeah, well, yeah, so 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 one has to look into that there are many ways of doing that actually like you know but i do not know how in the indian context that would work out but but the catch is that certainly, like you know, the multiple solutions which, are, which one can think of, and uh, and there is a need to sit down and to say, okay, in the Indian context, what will work, okay, and yes. uh, and how do you collect that water which you are cleaning the clean panel? Because in and India, this, this is a yeah, right. Like, so at the, at the easiest, is a major issue. at the very least, imagine like if you come to US, right? The houses have these gutters, right? The rainwater is collected along, right, at the gutter. Just simple, low cost gutter, right? It's just a, Aluminum hanging at the end of the PV panel, the water you put is collected, right? Uh, and then you can just rechannel it. Yes. Just like here, the water is from the roof is rechanneled to the to the to the to the waste, right? Okay. And uh, so there are many simple solutions, okay, and uh, and and very cost effective solutions actually to to, to use that water again. And uh, and it can be very complicated also, by the way, like you know, in the you could install sensors, direct water at different places. So from being very simple to very complex, like, yes, you know, yes. and uh, so there's a whole spectrum of solutions in between. And, and I do not know, like, you know, I, what will work best in the Indian context because I have never worked on a, on a, on a case in India, okay? I've never, you know, I was a 
Shahar Kalarka, you know, I grew up in a city, Arbon, you know, grew up, came to Kanpur, came here. So, so here I've been working on the farm now with, with my agriculture colleagues. So I'm getting some flavor of agriculture in the US, okay? But, but I have zero flavor of agriculture in, in the Indian context. So I really do not know. Unless so, they like go there and spend their time and, uh, you know. Yes, yes. So, so I, yeah, I also, because I see the panels outside and they collect so much dust and then I ask myself, so, like, how do we maintain these? How do we maintain these economically? How do we do this periodically without recruiting dedicated manpower? Who does that? Like, so there are things that we need figure out, of course. I, 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 you know, personal, it has to be also done very carefully. I can't just take a, water, a bucket of water and brush and go do it there because <laughs> then, because, you know, pretty soon the surface will be rough and the, all the light will be, will never reach to the, you know, you will form all those patterns and the brush, yes. like, you know, it scratches and all the light will be gone. Like You don't want to damage that. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so it has to be very carefully Wash. There are people who have done a lot of research in how to wash TV panel itself. Like it's not a trivial, you know, because in the old days people will go with a broom and just boom, 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 and then suddenly you realize that you destroyed the whole, whole panel. So yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kanwar. Uh, Professor Lalto, you can go ahead. Uh, just have one question. Uh, what is your view on the future of hydrogen energy generation by solar thermal route or the heat based hydrogen generation? What is the view on that of future? So, so that's a, so by solar thermal, you mean directly using the solar energy as a heat through concentrators yeah, and yeah, then yeah, do that, yeah, right? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. So I was very fascinated with that, by the way, in mid, like from 2013 to 2017. And I have published a couple of papers too, actually, on that. But one of the challenges with that, what I found was, uh, and I do not know, if, probably that might be even more a challenge in the Indian context, is the solar irradiation, what fraction is direct versus what fraction is diffused, okay? And, uh, and the question before you was the dust on the, on the solar panel. That's an indication, direct indication that the, there is a, the diffuse light is quite high because if there's too much dust in the atmosphere and, and if there's too much dust in the atmosphere, that means the, the light as it is traveling is getting uh, diffracted all along and, uh, and, and the direct component of the light is small. So, so unless and until for the locations where the direct component of the light is high, okay, like, you know, it, 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 may be, it may not make that much of a sense. But, and, and those calculations can be done, like, you know, in the sense that if 50% if of the light is direct and 50% uh, and is diffused, then if I put a solar thermal hydrogen, there is only 50% of the light I'm working with. And, and if I'm working with the 50% of the direct light, and if my efficiency is, is 50%, then, then I get only 25% of the solar radiation as, you know, as a hydrogen, or, or if that efficiency is only, 20% to hydrogen, then I get only 10% of that, right, as a hydrogen of, of the solar energy. On the other hand, the, a PV panel will work with the entire spectrum. And if it gives me a 20% efficiency, and then if I use an electrolyzer, which is 12% efficient, then I get to the same number, like 20% efficiency of the hydrogen. So I think, so the more I have thought about it, it, uh, I, it, uh, and that's why I have been I've been shying away a little bit from that. But uh, but but if if, it's, if, it's, if the direct component of the light is very high, then then certainly that would be a that would be a good thing. What's worth looking into? Okay. And, and but also like as long as you can find find material for those high temperatures which are involved, right? Like the temperatures really in a, approaching 1100 degrees Celsius from anywhere between 800 to 1100 degrees Celsius. Like those high temperatures itself brings it exciting material constraint and, uh, and uh, but nevertheless, I think, uh, so I've never sat down and looked in the Indian context as different locations, the diffuse versus the direct light. Okay. And, and that's the, that's, that would be the major issue in my mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can have a last question from Sarang. Uh, oh, Professor Agrawal. Yeah. So, uh, so when I saw the uh, pictures of uh, solar panels raised around 20 feet above the ground, I just run imagination that we may have a floating uh, farms, uh, solar farms. But that is a distant dream. But 
then coming to the ground so why don't we consider uh, covering uh, highways uh, uh, instead of uh, agricultural land because sure uh, sure there also sure. you have to have a framework uh, for installing uh, sort of panels yeah if, you, if people are looking into that too certainly certainly sarang yes okay but again is, is that area enough okay would be the question Oh, and uh, of yeah. course, on, on the side of the highways, like, uh, and, and that would be like, you know, the urban areas I was talking about 10% coverage that would be included there, I think. Okay. Okay. Because uh, you, you can put on the, on the site of the, of the, so of the highways, certainly, yes. Okay. Yeah, over the highways, actually, not the sideways. I mean, over the, yeah, the over the highways too. Yeah, you, you could certainly do that too. Maybe one uh, benefit I see people will have to use less AC in their car. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But again, it will probably on the highways probably because the trucks probably it will have to be built again high, high enough, and uh, yeah. and uh, because the trucks, if you have to build, because trucks will decide the height really, not the cars, and uh, and uh, and that height could be quite substantial, like you know, twenty feet for sure. Uh, and and I know from my own experience, twenty feet high PE panel is very expensive. <laughs> I can tell you that <laughs> for sure. Okay, it's quite expensive. Okay, it's. Uh, I think uh, Ashish asked the right right question. It uh, the height is is not not sustainable. Let's put it this way. So I understand that having solar farms floating over the sea is not practical at all, right? Is it? All right. Corrosion. 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 That wa that water is not the is not the trend. <laughs> that okay. uh, sea water is like has a lot of cats and dogs in it, right? Mm -hmm. So because that is a good. Uh, option because you just use the water there and, and yeah, wash absolutely. the panels. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. But but you know what, Sarang, the good thing is we have to use all our creativity. Where can we install it and rather than laying them on the side. So I, I take my answer back actually. Like <laughs> you are sure like what is in the book which says that we can't develop materials which can last on the ocean. That like you know everything has a counter, you know, one has to think like you know maybe it is a good material research into what what goes into making those things. Okay, I think uh, um, we've taken a lot of time in questioning and answering and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Agarwal for a wonderful lecture. Uh, <laughs> very, very, very quickly, okay? <laughs> very quickly. You have to mute yourself. You have to mute yourself. He's Professor from IIT Kharagpur. Yeah. So, yeah, I uh, did not find the right handwriting action here. That's why I'm turning the video on and trying to do that. Anyway. Uh, uh, Professor Agarwal, excellent talk, you know, very, very, uh, very excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much for, <laughs> I, I get a lot of yarn from this talk. But I have one, uh, two things. In fact, the Saran, whatever you asked, I also had the same thing. Railways and uh, highways are what we have. India can cover uh, a lot of space uh, in that because uh, 11, meet, 11 watt per meter square is something is what is the minimum you try to calculate with the uh, silicon ones. And another one, what I'm seeing is you, for the whole entire USA, you've calculated something like 1665 gigabyte per meter squared is the requirement. But this, I suppose it is considering the only, I mean, winters and everything put together, or suppose if you go to the Indian case, bright days are much more, then is, is that going to matter your calculations or the... No, no, it's true that, that no, it's true that watts per meter square is not going to going to matter at all because that watts per meter square with 1665 gigawatts per meter square, which you're talking about, that is the need of the country. So, so, okay. so, so, so you take India as a whole, okay, and take different sectors in India, okay, where the energy is being, being consumed, okay, and you look at the end use, okay, and then you say, okay, this is the total energy India, not energy, like total end use which shows up okay, constructively, okay. shows up, okay? And uh, so what is that in watts, okay? So, so basically translating that annual to per second, okay? okay. So, and, and that's the use. And, and, and the way we did the calculation was we did not want the fossil, so we know how much fossils is used. We did not want to directly translate that to, to gigawatt per meter square because that number is the wrong number because, uh, you know, in automobiles we are using 100, you know, units of energy, but it doesn't show up as as hundred units mm -hmm. of energy. At the end, it is only fifteen right. units of energy, which is really gone mm -hmm. to useful work. But if you gave me electricity, then electricity can be seventy five percent efficient with the same thing. So I would need like you know fifteen seventy five, like you know one fifth of the elect what I'm putting with gas petrol. I need only one fifth of that from electricity. Okay. So 
So I have to account for that. So in a solar world, I will need only, so whatever the automobiles or trucks, trucks are like 25% efficient. So, right, so again, yes. if you're doing it this, what is, so, so because the end use is the same, not that the fossil is, that energy is the same. So that's why we had to do those calculations. Yeah, yeah, I said, my graduate true. student has done that for India, by the way. My graduate student has done that for the India, except that he's making PV panels, PV, he's, he's experimentalist, he's making solar cells. So once she's making solar cells, so I never encouraged him to publish it. But maybe after this, after today, maybe I will go back and say, hey, Swash, why don't you pull it out? And let's, let's uh, you know, he should, he should publish it. I, it's my mistake, it's my error. I, I should have done that. Okay. So, so it matters, right? As the bright days and the uh, bright places and uh, places like US, you have a lot of winter and uh, you have no sunlight some of the days. So, considering that the PV requirement for India will be, you know, uh, I mean, you, you, can, you can you can still uh, work out sure, with the PV, sure. just with the PVs as well. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so you're totally right. So, what that means is, but the, the gigawatts per meter squared of the U country use will not change. However, what will change? Okay, is the how many watts per meter square being produced from the solar farm? So, That's so the that number, so, so number will be more close to ten and eleven rather than close to five and seven. Right, 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 right. Oh, excellent, excellent. So, 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 yeah, all these things taking into consideration that the, the whatever the program that is going to come out will be excellent. It will be used by many people. The, the calculation, whatever you are trying to do, you know, the, the entire program which you are developing, that will be excellent. <laughs> It yeah, so we have already published it. So I have to I have to be truthful. We are not doing any more calculations of this kind. It is already published. It is already out there. At least for the US, it is already out there. It provides a template to to you know if if anyone wants to do it for any other country, there's a template to it. And okay. uh, as I said, I, I've even even lost interest, as you could clearly see, because you know now we are more focused on I'm more focused on FSIM models now to how the agriculture you know the photosynthesis trying to right. learn. A chemical engineer is trying to learn about the what I call the the crops and uh, you know, so so it's like being a perpetual graduate student. I've never never <laughs> never left Kanpur. Okay, it's, I'm always <laughs> learning. It's like it's you right. know, against the grind all the time. So learning, Excellent. you learn one subject, then you have to learn the other one, and then you have to learn the other one. And, and it's a continuum <laughs> battle. Absolutely, learning is continuous. Absolutely, learning is continuous. Thank you. Learning to <laughs> learning to learn. <laughs> so with this. With this, we have uh, we'll close the session. Uh, the lot, uh, we thank Professor uh, Agarwal for sparing a lot of uh, uh, time with us, and uh, you know uh, from his very busy busy schedule. And Professor Agarwal, as a token of our appreciation, on behalf of the center, what we have done is we have created a Chandrakanta Keshwan Grove in the memory of Dr. Chandrakanta Keshwan, and where we plant uh, trees in the name of every speaker that we invite to our lecture series. Uh -huh. I uh, this is just to prevent the wastage uh, in the form of material gifts. So, uh, and this 14 trees site, actually the motto is uh, that a person, uh, if he or she plants 14 trees in his lifetime, uh, uh, then he or she will at least offset his or her own carbon emission. So this is just a, a, our small contribution uh, in your name, if you don't mind, <laughs> at uh, okay. 14trees.org. We will send you the details of this tree. So there is a dashboard of this tree in your name at the site, and we will send you the link, and you can monitor the health of the tree online. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank so you very is, much. This is our uh, small uh, uh, token of appreciation for your time, for your wonderful lecture, and we look forward to, of course, you are on our department's advisory board, and also as a, a distinguished visiting professor in our department, so we hope to have very long-term interactions with you in the future. And of course, I look forward to seeing you in Purdue uh, very shortly. Same here, same here. Thank you. I have just curious question. I have just curious question. Maybe we can stop recording and, and I'll, I'll just ask, go ahead. Ask. Why not Amwa? Why like, you know, you have written like, uh, 